Yes, I mean, yeah. Now I'm worried I might end too fast, but I'll try to not have that happen. Hey guys. Hello. Pizza's not here yet. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yo, how do I make this like. Hey, uh, Aaron, how do I make just a screen show without all this stuff? I don't know. I mean, I don't think you can. I, I think this is as good as it gets. Okay. Oh, that's fine. No, but because this computer is uh, projecting here, the WebEx room. All right, it's fine. This is full screen. Yeah. Top corner. This one? Oh, ask. To, it's a, yeah. It's a different button. I also got a. This is asking for control over like the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, so I'll do the introduction. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know. We're not used. Are we using No, I, I don't know. Is it even on? Yeah. I don't know. Okay, everybody. Um, the pizza is not here yet, but John assures us that it's almost here. We ordered from Defazio's set at five forty-five delivery time. What can you do? Uh, we're gonna get started though with the talk, and we'll bring the pizza in when it gets here. People can grab some some food uh, during the talk, I guess. Um, so first, I just want to say. Uh, Quick announcement. So for those of you who were here a month ago for or in Amos Eaton a month ago for the first talk in this series uh, that I gave, I ended that talk trying to tease what the next two talks might be for this semester. Uh, based on the response from that first talk a month ago, we decided to um, change our plan. So we have different people coming in to speak. And so the topics of this talk and the next talk in November will not be what I sort of teased. I apologize if that's disappointing for everybody, but those two talks that we teased, uh, we're working on the, like, still working on the, that content this semester. And uh, I think we're hoping to give talks about those topics maybe next semester and the continuation of this series. Um, so that said, I want to introduce uh, Inwan, who's going to give the talk today. He's a grad student, I think, second year. Here working with uh, Professor Oshani, and so he's going to be talking about his own use of llama models. Uh, so it, thank you. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. So I'll start with the disclaimer. I will not call myself an expert in this topic, but what I'm trying to do with this talk, I'm hoping to achieve, is to really share what I was able to get working, like an easy way to get a working pipeline of using these uh, local. Llama models and um, how to fine tune them and some basic concepts that are you should know if you want to use these models. So, and I uh, guess I uh, shout out to Trip who was not able to make it today. He's an undergrad student we're working with. He uh, helped me a lot with the slides as well. And both of our contacts will be at the end of the slide. So, let's start with the open versus closed source LLMs. So, we are pretty familiar with the closed source versions. The, most well known is uh, OpenAI, GPT-4, GPT-3.5, uh, ChatGPT. It should be GPT-3.5, I think, um, and Anthropic, which is backed by Amazon, I think, with their much cheaper and larger um, context window size models called Cloud. Question. Yes. Are you recording this? Uh, John claimed he was. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, and so with these models. Well, the biggest notable thing is really that they usually are better. They just don't tell us how they made it better. It's probably because they, the companies that built these models have a lot of computing power and various types of data sets that are maybe not open to the public. But the biggest problem with these is that it requires payment per token. So it's not like you can borrow a model at a fixed price and use it. The more you use it, it'll cost you more. So that's where uh, we have our open source models. So these are, well, some people can argue that they're not like, they're not like fully open source because the, uh, 
the way they're trained and all the data sets are not open, but the weights are available. That's what we will mean when we say open source here. And so what that means is that you only need the computing infrastructure to use these models. Um, so I guess something to note, if you're trying to like do a startup with these, you probably shouldn't because you are not supposed to use these for commercial uses, I think. Uh, but the nice part about these um, open source models is that because you have the weights, you can run it on your own computer and also modify these weights to make it more specific to your desired task. Yes, Abraham. Oh, very cool. Maybe you should do it then. Um, yeah, so the most notable source is our friends at Meta uh, with the Llama model and the Google and I think Bloom, I've been hearing about it. I haven't used it myself, but it's also supposed to be a significant player out there with by big science. So um, I want to start off, and this will be sort of our main thing that we cover. So when I was getting into these, if, if you guys are familiar with uh, how stable diffusion worked, like there was a whole thing. One of the one of the things that caused it to gain so much popularity was a nice user interface. Not everyone wants to work with like Python code. Look at their terminal; they want things to click, and you know it shows right off the bat. And so these guys basically try to do the same thing for LLM. So what they do is make a user interface that you can view, uh, you can run as a server on your computer and you know, interact with it. And also it comes with the API. Uh, we'll cover that a bit later. But these are the two biggest, I think, um, ones that I have found. So the first one is Uba Buga, it's a funny name. Um, this guy uh, or gal is, Pretty much kind of the standard it seems. They, their name is there. This project is mentioned in a lot of different places, and a lot of official sources now support this, uh, support this tool officially, which is great. So that means it'll pro work pretty much like off, off the bat with a lot of the open source models. And it also supports like a wide variety of um, loaders. So that means more efficient backends sometimes for different models uh, that we're getting pretty low level there, but essentially what, yeah, it just has a lot of support and the stars kind of really matter uh, at this stage of this field it, because we need attention from people to keep improving the project and find bugs and fix them. And the second one is fast chat. Uh, this one, I mean, I'm not gonna cover this, but it's also pretty popular. It's built by the creators of Vicuna or Vicuna. Um, one cool thing it does is a chatbot arena. So you can like sort of set up different LLMs to talk to each other, um, which is cool, I guess. But other than that, it's pretty much the same uh, web interface from your end, end user's point of view. But it is, I will say, more scalable, but that doesn't really matter unless you have multitudes of GPUs at your hand. And yeah, so these are pretty both popular. And I think I've also heard about VLLM. I was look, taking a look earlier. That also seems promising. So there are a lot of these projects that are out there to help you get started with these models. And we're going to focus on the first one, Uba Buga, because I was able to get everything working with it. You can pr pretty much do the same thing with the other ones. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but yeah, just because I know how to use this one, I will cover this. So first thing to start with is why should I use a server? So the most, if you use like Python at all, the most intuitive way is to load the model in your code, use whatever uh, called your methods on it, but the, it does not scale at all. So if you and your lab mates, whoever is sharing the computer re computing resource, both want to run that script, there's gonna be two instances of the model living in the memory. And that will likely not work very well, especially with these humongous models where you can't even fit more than one instance on the same GPU. So what instead what you can do is Start a server with the model in the back end that takes in the input and just gives you the output. And this also, so this allows multiple users to use the model. I mean, it's gonna be a bit slower, but it's okay. At least we can do things in parallel. And uh, another really nice thing to think about is that usually I've been hearing this a lot. So if you do op like only open source or only GPT, people then start complaining about not doing the other. So you should probably, if you're like doing any form of benchmark benchmarking, it might be worth looking at like say uh, OpenAI as well. And OpenAI sort of has set the standard for some of the API calls, which the uh, prod tool I'm gonna cover also uh, provides a wrapper for. So what this means is that you can use the same piece of code from the client side to just, and switch out the different backends. 
and you'll be able to do the same experiment in a pretty consistent manner. Um, yeah, so there's my rationale behind using the server. And this is a quick screenshot. I know this is a little overwhelming. I think I took this from their official thing. So this is just like their chat interface. We don't really care about this as we will find out. I mean, it's cool to play around with, but, um, and a whole different set of parameters you can tweak around in the model. We'll cover some of these. There are a lot of these parameters, and so they're pretty well documented. So if you're really curious, you should Google for them. Peach is here, by the way. Um, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you Can you hear me? Hello. Am I coming through at all? Yeah, maybe I'll mute the mic. Uh, we're taking a pizza break, guys. We'll be back in five minutes.
Okay, yeah, so the pizza ran out. Yeah, we did. All right. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, man. Should have gotten in there ahead of the line. All right. Yeah, all right, guys, I'm going to continue, okay? So, here is an overview of the state of art of open source models. It's really um, the Llama variants, mostly. And then there's a Falcon 7B. Falcon had a lot of hype. I'm not sure what happened to it, but maybe it's still good. But uh, uh, according to this table, which is on the Hugging Face website, Llama 2 70B chat is the best. And the difference between 70B and 70B chat is that the chat version is fine-tuned after the initial uh, initial like pre-training for uh, chat-specific tasks. I guess that makes it even better. Or maybe actually, no, they are assigning it the same score. But yeah, Llamas 2 70B seems to be pretty much the best model. And that's what we, well, actually, yeah, you can actually use this tool on any other model, but yeah. All right, so. We're going to start talking about some basic ideas that have allowed us to have these models at our hands and our relatively local server machines. First thing is parameter efficient fine tuning. So this is uh, what's also known as LoRa. So it's basically an idea to learn additional weights. So what we do is that we don't actually touch the original pre-trained models weights, but what we do is we learn sort of a addition matrix that's the same sh uh, same shape as the model's weight so that we just add to it so that we are not like going through this entire thing that's already there. And another, and well, I said same shape, but in LoRa, it's not even the same shape. So we actually decompose it into two smaller matrices. And then we uh, learn these weights in such a way that when uh, combined, these two small matrices will produce uh, some set of weights that we have learned. So this really allows us to uh, decrease the number of parameters involved like a lot and um, uses also less uh, disk space because even disk wise, these models are pretty large and it also saves on, uh, well, actually, yeah, it does use l less memory when training because you don't have like a full matrix up in there. You only, you, you only just need to compute it every time. Um, and a good library, I guess, is PEFT. I think Trip added this, Adapter Transformers. This is this is supposed to be like the older, this was what was used before like Hugging Face came up with tef, uh, PEFT. But PEFT is basically, it seems to be the official Hugging Face library. Works pretty well. You should definitely check it out if you're uh, fine tuning it. But the basic idea here is that this LoRa technique is used to break down what the weights we learn into a smaller representation so that it's more efficient. Um, okay, and another term you probably heard a lot about is quantization. So what this means is we are essentially tra um, changing the data type of the model into a smaller uh, data type that uses less memory, really. That's what it is. So you can start with, I think, yeah, usually it's flip 16 or uh, 32 for the matrix weights. But if we somehow come up with a formula to transform these weights into an integer, or even a smaller integer, then we are able to save a lot more memory per uh, cell of these weights. So again, there's a lot of libraries that do this, and this is where it gets a little wonky because people have different implementations, and you got to make sure you're using the right loader for the right uh, quantized model. But the most notable ones, I think, are bits and bytes, auto GPTQ, and uh, XLama. XLama, I think, is specific to Llama. It's like made by Facebook or Meta Research. Um, so, obvious pros is less memory in both uh, inference and training. Why? Because the matrix is smaller. But obviously, another obvious con then is that there is a lower accuracy because we're doing the same math that we were doing with like high precision floats with now possibly like int, int 8, int 4 uh, types. But uh, my personal experience, it works actually pretty well enough. So, um, like for example, if you use a Llama 70B 4 bit, it's better than any of the full-sized smaller Llama models, at least in the task I said. It's hard to make definitive statements, but um, yeah, quantization is another thing, yeah, that will allow you to host the model in your own uh, space. So, 
Then we will move on to using these models. Uh, we're gonna start with the common inference parameters. And the, I'm only gonna uh, cover these three, but I think this link has a documentation of all the other uh, parameters you, that you saw in the screenshot too, and what they mean. And yeah, so let's start with the temperature. This is pretty, probably the most commonly talked about parameter. It essentially controls sort of the randomness of how the token is chosen. So I guess maybe I should have added another slide before here, but for LLMs usually, um, how it works is that we uh, predict some form of embedding that will come after a given text. And then we do a similarity check in our dictionary and pick the sort of the highest uh, likelihood uh, or token with that, uh, to that embedding. And by controlling the temperature, we, we sort of add a bit, add a, I guess a normalization to this uh, mechanism. So we essentially divide the likelihood by the temperature so that the lower, uh, and then it's soft maxed again, so they sum up to one. So we can uh, control, we can allow the smaller probabilities to sort of stand out a bit more. We'll uh, show this in our pseudo animation. And yeah, what if you set the temperature to zero? I don't think it'll work. I mean, they're probably smart enough to add like a small tiny number in the padding, but it's essentially pretty much random in that case. You should definitely, uh, if you're curious, you should try it out. So here is, so these on the x-axis are basically different tokens and the y-axis is their likelihood of being chosen. So this is what it looks like with the temperature 0.25. But as we increase the temperature, we can see that the likelihood of the less, less like other tokens are becoming much greater relatively. And so then there's the like more likelihood of the model choosing these um, less likely tokens, which, oh, I thought that was a hand up. Um, yeah, so temperature, you can sort of think of as controlling, adding more randomness to how the next token is chosen. The next one is top K. So it's a pretty straightforward name. So it, you choose the next top K. Uh, token. So you don't, you don't choose more than that uh, for every, uh, I guess, next word generation, you only choose up to the K, uh, tokens. So the certain number here is top K in this example, I think this is the same one we showed, uh, in the temperature example, we would, uh, choose everything or we would choose only B and E because those are the top two most likely tokens. Another one top P. And I think I remember reading, you shouldn't use this with top K. It's kind of, it's, it's a little weird, but it's another, uh, method to sort of filter out tokens with, uh, depending on their likelihoods. Uh, should we have access? Okay. Yes, we, you will have access to the slide. Maybe ask John about the link. Um, uh, yeah, so it's called the nuclear sampling and we remove the lowest probability as long as the sum of the probabilities adds up to this top p value so we'll show an example here again we uh want we set a top p to 0.9 and then we have this set of probabilities so we got to start we're going to start taking out these tokens uh starting from the lowest probability so are you as you can see okay um the probability you know the sum keeps going down as it should but now when we try to take out C, we see that it goes under our uh, top P threshold and we can't have that happen. So we're not gonna do that and we're gonna stop here. So that's how this top P parameter works. So I guess that's a brief overview of some ideas on how to use the model, LoRa, quantization, some of the basic parameters. And now the real question is, how do I get these weights? You want these, right? So you should probably fill out the official request form uh, for Llama. I don't think you need to anymore because it's like pretty much open access in other spaces, but they do have an official Hugging Face repository. So you can only get access to it if you fill out this form. If this link doesn't work, you can Google something. Something will still probably be there, but you can also use unofficial, unofficial. Well, uh, it's like not even unofficial anymore. I think this guy is like getting funded by someone to keep doing what he's doing. So this dub bloke is the guy for our different uh, variants of weights for now. And uh, he also, yeah, officially supports the whole web UI that I discussed. So it's a pretty uh, good combination so far. So we'll take a look at the bloke's repository. This guy has 1600 models up in here. 
So that's, you know, how do you, how do you choose your model? Uh, I guess the easiest thing would be to sort by download count, but maybe that's not the case. Uh, so you do want to be looking at, for example, it says dash chat here. This means that the pre-trained model was fine-tuned to be a chat model, um, other, uh, rather than just a next word predictor model. So it's more conversational. Um, and this dash GPTQ, as you could probably guess, means that uh, it was quantized using GPTQ. So maybe you may have a preference for certain quantization method. And then this right here, it was fine-tuned using QLora. Again, I guess, you know, so, so these sort of things can uh, help you make your decision, but I usually just look up llama and take the llama fine tuned ones. But yeah, the, there are a lot of choices out here to play around with. So uh, I guess this I'm gonna walk through this I guess because I have them here, um, so I don't have to like click around. So here's how you use the web UIs really. So you can go to the model tab and you can actually just type in the name here and then you can just pull click download, it'll set everything up in the, under its own uh, directory. And then you can simply refresh the list and then you, you should see your model there. And it's simple as clicking load. Um, if you care about the speed, which I guess maybe, yeah, you probably should, it'll auto detect the loader for the quanta if, it's, if it requires a different type of loader, but you can play around with different ones. You will notice that some of them are much, much slower. And again, you can set all of these parameters down below um, as you load the model. Um, and, oh, I guess I ordered this maybe not so optimally. I wanted to show the code first, but um, another big thing about this uh, web UI tool is that it has API support. Um, so that means as the, the thing I said before, you can write your script that simply makes an HTTP request. Doesn't need to like load the model and all that business. So it has both like its own API, which gives a lot of like fine grained control um, and a lot of the raw parameters in there. But mm, like the downside to that is that it's not the OpenAI API, but it does also have the OpenAI API. You should definitely check their uh, supported supported endpoints. But for chat completion, pretty much everything is supported. So again, yeah, that's the same point. You can if you just set the parameters right when you create the server, you can just use the OpenAI API and pretend it's uh, GPT, although it lives in it lives on your machine. So yeah, that's how you do it. You go to the session and you can enable these extensions. There's a bunch more. I have not tried them. I guess I see a whisper one, that could be cool. But um, yeah, feel free to explore and you can also write your own extensions, I believe, as long as you sort of follow their uh, API. So um, this is really for documentation purpose. If you don't want to like, you know, for the port and go on the website and click things, you can just do this in a single or two set of commands. You just clone it to the right uh, place. So ensure it's under the models directory of the, uh, of the web UI project. And you can just start the server with these arguments. And uh, some other more fine like model specific arguments you can also change in their configuration file. But yeah, in this example, I'm doing the same thing that I did by clicking, except now I don't really even need to look at the web UI. It's, yeah, it's, I would say web UI is useful for like initial exploration, but uh, if you're doing a lot of things, probably using it through uh, the server interface is better. Yeah, so this is an example code for the OpenAI API. Uh, if you guys have used this, this probably looks familiar. So it's a list of dictionaries where there's two keys, um, the role and the content. So it, we have three types of roles. I think OpenAI came up with this. Maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But usually there's the machine, the LLM, and there's a system who's basically like the god of LLM that tells the LLM you should do this. And then there's a user, a human, who the LLM must respond to. So you can like, and uh, I will also have a link to the Git repo with the examples. They work up until now. Maybe it'll not work when things break, but they work for now. Um, yeah, so you can have this and you just put in a fake key and you hit that endpoint, uh, the local host, and bam it'll talk to you. So, and I didn't need to do this right, right here. I, uh, I don't know if you, how well you guys can read this, but first message I said, the user says, you're a helpful assistant. You will answer questions, reply with yes, if you understand. And then the second message assistant said, yes, I understand. And then user asks the question, what color is the sky? And then the LLM, as it always does, give me this long answer that 
is not quite clear. It should just say it's blue, but it's, sometimes it's very hard to get it to do the like the specific um, format. But the idea here is that you can sort of the what I wanted to show by doing this is that you can simulate a history of chat by um, creating this list of interactions. And I think OpenAI, this is also how it, they do it in the chat in their in their web UI, like the chat. It's a little smarter, I think. They have a way to reference the old uh, embedding, so they don't have ev not everything needs to be passed to the model. And this is again why the closed source models suck. Because why don't they give us that endpoint? Because now, if you want to have a multi-stage conversation, your cost is literally going to accumulate for uh, every line you have. You have to feed that entire dialogue again, unless you have another like summarization or whatever thing happening there. But yeah, so you can do this. So in fact, I could just say. The first message, and hopefully it'll say, yes, I understand my task is blah, blah, blah. But I told it that this is what you said, remember? And I'm going to say this, and that then the model will say the next thing. So you can sort of emulate a conversation by using this list structure. And uh, it's not too important, but it's the same thing for this guy. Uh, it's a, the, the data structure is a little weird, but essentially, it assumes that it's a list of lists where the first element of the inside list is assumed to be the user input, and the second is always assumed to be the machine output, which makes sense, I guess, right? The machine is not going to say something to you that whether you respond to. Um, and again, you can do the same thing. And they, in here, though, they make it sound better with the history. And again, it says the same thing about like a very vague response about the color of the sky. Um, yeah, so this is a very quick way to start talking with these. So again, to uh, reiterate, you can just start the server, load the model, run one of these scripts, you're talking to an LLM. And another thing to think about is what the prompt, what the model actually sees, the uh, next word, I guess, yeah, our large language model. So in this one, I think I was using uh, something called, it was a fine-tuned version of Llama 2 for like instruct by these guys called Upstage. And for some reason, they change the headings, but usually what happens here is, I uh, hope you can see my, you can't see my cursor. Yeah, like uh, in this template they used for fi their fine tuning, uh, the user and the response and the system uh, tag starts with the three hash, uh, what do you call these? Anyways, three sharps, I guess, um, hashtags, yeah. Um, and you, all, you again have to remember to you, it looks like you're talking to them, but what they're really doing is they're reading this long dialogue in one document, and they're saying, based on this, this should probably come next. So that's, I think, is pretty important to keep in mind. It's not like this magical thing that's like sitting inside, like a human, like sitting in a box somewhere, actually answering you. It's this is what it's always seeing is this long piece of text. Um, and again, like if you use different models, you should definitely make sure what template to use, because if not, it probably won't work so well. And that's usually documented in the model page. Uh, if not, maybe you shouldn't use it. But uh, yeah, the Llama official one, it looks very different from this. But I just wanted to uh, show you what the actual model's input looks like. So I think Abraham pointed something strange out with this. Actually, you're right. So there, are, there shouldn't be the two S tags. Um, I pulled this one. So the task of the model is still text completion, as I have just said. So what you want to do when you fine tune the model is you essentially have it learn. It's like whatever masking or next word prediction test. It'll it'll handle that usually, at least in the transform library. And you so you give it a series of text, and you say learn this text, learn how it works, how how it's. Uh, how it's constructed and all that. And so this was an example that I pulled from actually someone else's tutorial on Hugging Face. But I think, yeah, I do agree that this prompt looks a little weird. Um, anyways, yeah, so you will, you, you're will you supposed to be feeding in some piece of text like this, right? So you have these uh, different tags. So again, this text really describes sort of the interaction between the user. And so you're not just giving it like a thing, a book. I guess you could, but like, at fine tuning stage, unless you have a uh, copious amounts of data, what you want to be giving it is an interaction history uh, with the correct response at the end. So ideally, it'll learn to say the correct things given similar uh, interactions. Um, again, I guess, yeah, I'm just having it on the PowerPoint for documentation purposes. These are the libraries that you should probably pay attention to. 
Uh, Accelerate, I've been seeing these guys a lot. It's for managing your device. I think it's supposed to help a lot more with distributed settings. If any of you is lucky enough to have more than one GPU on your systems. Um, and uh, PEFT, this is what we described for the LoRa. So this is what adds the LoRa adapter to the base model. And bits and bytes, it's for the quantized uh, bit manipulation, and it can also be used to quantize it. But I will say this, you probably don't need to quantize your own model because people have them up there. Because quantizing is also expensive if you think about it. You need to load the full model at some point. So, like, I mean, you will see, like, people saying you can quantize this, this, but, like, if it's out there, I say just use what's out there unless it doesn't work. Um, and we quantizing is the changing the data type of the the weights of the model so that it takes less memory so yeah from float to int so they i guess came up with some algorithm to um, convert these weights into a smaller data type i think so in my examples or in my experiments i've been using the four bit quantize which means it's using int fours to represent its weights which is ridiculous but it somehow works um yeah, I think in general, right, it's quantization where you take, you want to take some continuous data and put it into discrete like buckets, right? So yeah, you... yeah, and I guess that makes more sense probably than what I just said. Yeah, that that is what's happening by putting it into these lower precision uh, buckets. Um, and transformers, I guess you can't do a NLP without these guys. So yes, sorry. Element wise, uh, I want to say yes. I haven't actually followed too much into it. Oh, I see. It's really for saving the RAM space and stuff because if you think about it, say, I should know this, but I forgot. But hmm. oh, yeah, and I I agree. I guess that's more like kind of like what LoRa does. It sort of it's deconstructs this large vectors into small sets of vectors. Um, I guess you could do that to a full model, but that yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I will say this, all of these will lower your accuracy or the performance of the model. So it's like a battle between saving space, being efficient, fast versus having good outputs. Um, yeah, like you can like definitely condense the models more, but maybe it'll start spewing gibberish. I don't know. So that's, but yeah, that's something we can also think about. Um, yeah, and uh, finally, the TRL library for training reinforcement learning models. If you want to have a whole pipeline, I don't usually use it, but it's out there if you want to uh, do reinforcement learning as well, like the whole human, what is it, human H, H, H something RF. Yeah, RLHF. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so you got to load the model. Maybe apply LoRa or load the model with the LoRa, or no, actually, yeah, you should apply the LoRa to the model uh, instead of yeah training the entire model weight, ideally, um, not ideally, but if you have any form of limitations, or you could also download some models with the LoRa included and add another LoRa on top. Now this is where it gets kind of funky. You can kind of it's like it's like wearing a shirt. You can like just keep putting on more shirts. Um, you can do that. I don't. Know. I don't know how well it worked. <clears throat> um, so yeah, and other than that, it's kind of the same thing as fine tuning any other transformers model. Like as I said, uh, it's really a kind of it learns from text. It learns to learns representations of text. So, but it, we just use new libraries now that are because they're so huge and difficult to use. Um, and I have the links. This is the one that I referenced, and this is also a working version that I had. I think I yeah added some notes here. If you use Llama, um, there's some strangeness that sh I think will be patched soon. I saw open issues, but you will have, you should pay attention to these. Yeah, yeah. so you can like use the from pre-trained with the revision branch to just load the quantized model, which the bloke usually has. Um, and for the little flags that you need to enable, otherwise it'll complain. This is just to save your 
few minutes of Googling. Um, yeah, so preparing the data for fine tuning. I think I said this like five times, but yeah, LLMs work in text. So it, everything needs to be in text. Uh, we have to, that means the input, whatever it is, maybe if it's classic classification task or there's some numbers involved, you should still need to wrap it into a pure text format. And it can also handle like, um, actually, actually, so it's good practice to use, uh, they say to use like special delimiters, like back ticks, like triple back ticks, or I don't know, like percent uh, symbols or something to note anything special. And I think it, yeah, it's supposed to also be able to handle JSON because the data it was trained on had a lot of these. And then the template, you can kind of choose arbitrary. I say this, but I think maybe the best idea is to just use the template that Llama used. And uh, this is actually an example from one of the projects I did uh, using Llama. We didn't fine tune it then, but um, you sort of have this instruction and notice how the instruction is very long. It's because we couldn't get Llama to say the exact thing. So we had to keep adding rules, but it worked for the most case. And then we sort of, uh, so this was a preference detection task. So we would have a comment and two topics, I guess, entities that are discussed in the comment. And um, so it comes in a tabular form usually with the text row and the two entity names, but we have to represent it in a single piece of text for the LLM. So what we would do here, is we describe what we're giving to it. The, I, I tell it, you need to detect the preference between these two options given this text. And then for the task, I sort of made up this template to wrap the task into a single piece of text. Uh, and again, I, I don't actually know if this works better, So, but I just converted everything into a text uh, domain. So instead of having numerical labels, you can also convert it. I, this is like, I didn't even try using it the other way, so I don't know if it's better, but... Um, that this is an example of that how I did it. Um, and yeah, so again, broadly speaking, there are two options for fine tuning. So you can use Python, which I guess the second option, it also uses Python. It's just that you're not touching it um, or use the web UI. So it depends on like what you're comfortable with. So if you've like used like transformers and fine tuned BERT or something before, probably easier to use Python script. But if you really want to try something out, but you you think it'll take too long, you could like you know try it out with the web UI as long as you you know follow their whatever format. Um, I will say I guess uh, more fine tuned control is available on using Python, but web UI seems to do do a pretty decent job and it's integrated pretty well, so it's not a bad choice by any means. Um, this is a quick pipeline, and I'm not gonna yeah. Uh, you don't like put the code here because you can find the same code like in seven different places by Googling how to uh, fine tune Llama, uh, but it is on the GitHub. So yeah, you load the model using transformers, maybe quantize it, or maybe you loaded it already quantized. You parse your data set, and then you just have a whole lot of parameters to configure. So, you know, where to save the model, um, and then your machine learning parameters, like what kind of optimizer do I use, learning rate, weight decay, well, well, there's a lot of those. Um, so maybe, yeah, if it's confusing, I think just using the ones that you see people use is probably good enough. And then obviously you gotta train and save the model. Now, this is where it's nice. So what you're saving is not the actual entire model. You're only saving the LoRa of the model. So that's your shirt of the model. So yeah, maybe I should have used something else, but um, I already made that analogy. Um, you sort of load, so that what that means is that when, when you, you can actually you load this model, you load this LoRa, put it onto whatever the base, from the base model, and you can stack, actually, maybe you, mm, I haven't tried how, for how like stacking multiple LoRa's would work, but the idea is that this right here, what you fine tuned on is pretty small actually, and it's uh, pretty um, portable. And I think there is a way to actually merge the two models, the pre-trained and LoRa weights, when I tried it, some some of the convolutions were not completely implemented. Maybe I was looking at the wrong thing, but that's another thing you can also consider. But again, not to worry because it's pretty easy to just put the adapt LoRa adapter onto the base model, both using the web UI and the thing. Yeah, so, and the option two, web UI, has a training tab, and then you can, actually, so one thing I will mention is you need to have the, some LoRa weights because it wants to copy the shape of the matrices from there. So maybe you can do, I don't know, you can just run my like example script to make a 
horrible set of weights, but the shape is right. And then you can uh, start copying that shape and do whatever here. And uh, I think the tutorial here has a pretty good documentation of how you should format your data, data to, uh, so that it understands how to uh, use it. And yeah, so loading the, now loading the LoRa, again, the web UI version of this is you go to the model. I think we saw this before too. So you load the base model and then you can also refresh and you can, um, you can see your uh, LoRa's. And I guess if you use Python, you just have to make sure you move it to the right directory under LoRa's. But now you can actually just load this. Uh, so I guess you would load the mod model first and then you say apply LoRa. And there you go, you have a, you have a fine tuned LLM at your hands. So another thing we can think about, I guess, again, this is applicable to people with a lot of computing power. You can distribute it. Uh, I was reading this article, which seemed pretty interesting. I do not have the luxury of multiple GPUs at my deck to try it out, but I think it'll be worth looking. Raytune is a pretty good library for distributed training and they have, uh, they already have their whole thing for uh, LLMs. So if you're doing anything large scale, maybe consider this. I know there are other um, methods out there too, but anyway, yes. Have you tried this on the cluster though? Uh, okay, well, see, I don't wanna be like that guy and take over like three nodes. I could do that, but. You could do it for a while until I yell at you. Okay, well, I'm gonna take that as a permission to do whatever I want. <laughs> You can do it on the CCI, but I guess the problem with like, if you're using Amos is that you can't really have the web UI stuff because, uh, well, maybe if you can, yeah, if you can forward a port, you can still have it. Uh, yeah. Yes, but actually you can't do the downloading of the model. So you need to set that up ahead of time, write some script, probably not script because it needs Git, it needs internet to download. But yeah, you can, you can do this on the, on the CCI and just checkpoint your models there. Um, I guess I haven't, felt the need to go this far into fine tuning a model yet. So I haven't tested it out, but yeah, it should work. Same question as Jason. I did not see Jason's question. What rough specs of the server? Oh, great question. So, oh man, I can't expand this. Uh, I think I was on the idea cluster with our new fancy A100 with 80 gigabytes of VRAM. It's pretty comfortable. Um, I think I can load up to the full model for inference, but if I start trying to train it, then it'll complain about lack of memory. But for the Llama 4-bit, which I think is a pretty great option, maybe if I can pull up, I feel like, okay, maybe this is too much. Yeah, I think from memory, it, there's this model, uh, other machine that I use that has uh, one of those not like A-series model uh, GPUs with 48 gigabytes of RAM, and it was still able to chug along pretty well for the 4-bit, up to, yeah, 4-bit 7DB Llama model. Um, so a desktop, you might need to have a pretty nice GPU. I don't have a desktop, but I think you can also run these on the CPU actually. So if you have enough RAM to load it in the CPU, there are adapters specifically for speeding it up on the CPU. So you could definitely try that out, but I couldn't tell you, at least from my experience on that one. Yeah. Not to speak for Jim Hemler, but yes. uh, to speak for Jim Hemler, um, we, it would really be worthwhile to figure out to what extent we can. Yeah. Um, so I have been actually thinking about this because I mean, so far I don't feel bad because I don't see anyone else trying to use the GPU, but I do like pretty much take like more than half of it so it makes it unusable for people whenever I'm doing stuff with it. So, but if we can have a dedicated node that serves a certain model that we think is the best one, then that would be like, you know, not now people can just hit that server instead. With our new hypervisor. Mm -hmm. we have oh, yeah. GPU capable hypervisor, we could possibly do that. So we yes, we could. Suspect out what you want. And oh, boy. So. Okay, yeah, my... Yes, I agree. No, but the, I think we need more CPUs, man. We need more threads. Yeah. Landing pad, well, I feel, I have a suspicion people are running code on the landing pad. They shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, yes, I agree. Um, but yeah, no, well, I, I would like more CPUs if possible, if you're asking. Yes, but yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah, so there is that. And uh, how do I exit full screen? Okay. I think 
I just to prove to you that I was able to do the things that I talked about. This is running on idea cluster node 07 right now. Uh, I wasn't having a lot of good luck with the using the chat. Um, and I did, I will say, so I got the fine tuning working. I still have to, I, there's some stuff I need to figure out because it's not quite doing what I want. But again, these are all the tabs that we talked about. And it's really, really slow right now because I loaded it through transformers. I think it's much faster if usually if I load it through Xlama or um, Auto GPTQ, but I'm not sure if that will work with my LoRa, which I see right here. So yeah. Uh, Wrong shirt. Yeah. Oh, it's the right shirt. It's the same one. Uh, no, it's the uh, this is fine tuned on the same preference data set that I talked about. So it's actually learning to do this classification task. And one of the biggest things that I was hoping to teach it was instead of giving me like a paragraph of a sentence, I want a single word response, but that has been very difficult. Um, yeah, anyways, so there is that. And uh, I think I added a link to my GitHub for any references. All those codes, to my knowledge, they work if you do everything the way I just described. And again, I want to say this is not the only way to do th do things, but this is one of the ways. And I found it pretty easy enough to like figure out. And there, uh, this tool being so popular also means that it's pretty easy to like Google for resources. So I hope this was helpful, and I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. That's fun. Question. Yes. So, have you done most of your work with Llama to the chat fine tuning? Yeah. Yeah. And so, have you tried using Llama to the stop fine tuning like chat? I think uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't think I did extensively. Actually, I just heard that it though because what I was trying to do was like kind of chat based, so I figured it'll work better. Actually, the last one I did. Oh, I saw a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I, uh, I actually used a fine tuned version of Llama 2 chat fine tune. Mm -hmm. So that one was like instruct and it was supposed to be, again, like a lot of things here are empirical, I would say. You could yeah. manually test them out, but um, hopefully you would know better is why I used that one. Yeah. Jade? So uh, this question for you and also for John. Are these slides going to be available on here? Are you going to? Yes. Yeah. Well, there, so there's a. Uh, Basically, an event page for this okay. this evening, and there's going to be a link to the the video, and there's going to be the slides. Okay. And and you already saw the slides have links embedded. In. And that'll just give the idea of that RPI. No, that's it's actually a, a kind of. A, I, I thought in my email I actually had a link to the event page. Maybe I did that, but. So yeah, this you only uses thirty eight gigs right now. Not bad. So two people could load there. Yes. You are looking for a one two award as a answer. Uh, do you have any tips or settings that you can do on that? Uh, you that can you limit the max tokens. Maybe other people might know better, but that was what I tried. But what I noticed happens there is that it doesn't change the generation. It just cuts off after that token. So that doesn't help me at all because it starts with two words from a beginning of a sentence instead of the two words that I want to see. Maybe if you have any more comments, Abraham. So the question, uh, yeah. this is Booba Booga with the B, yes. So uh, this, this tool allows you to do training. Um, I was wondering how the tool deals with early stock. Great question. I haven't looked into it myself. I think, let's see. Make sure we keep the question. So okay, yeah. So Abraham was asking how this training tool will uh, deal with early stopping. Uh, it might be an option. It might be advanced option. Let's see. Not so advanced. Uh, we got some optimizers or yeah. Yeah. So maybe it doesn't do that. Again, I guess this isn't like meant to replace your entire. It's not like a yeah one to one copy of the entire transformers API. It's really for people to get started with it. But yeah. So I guess I I guess they don't do it. That's my answer. So there's 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 stuff like. Steps at mm -hmm. Yeah, some basic stuff, but yeah, not everything. Oh, yeah.
something. Yeah, I guess they're not doing something like that. Uh, hmm, that's interesting. So how do you check overfitting in text? I guess if it's too. Hmm, okay. Yeah, well, again, yeah, this is pretty basic tool. So if you want anything more optimized, you should be using Python. It's not that hard to learn. Any more questions? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm going to stop my screen, though. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yes, thank you all for showing up. Uh, this turnout was awesome. Obviously, we ran out of pizza again. There'll be more. There'll be, there'll be, there'll be even more uh, next time. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to. Um, so, for this semester, we have one more of these talks scheduled. I believe it's for November 15th. Um, and Abraham, you're, are you on the slate for that? We talked last time, right? Are you? Okay. Well, can you be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can talk. We can talk about it. I don't know. If, I just wanted to know if that was still on your radar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. We'll talk. But yes, thank you all for being here. Okay.